So I'm actually going to start a step away from physics real quick. Um, this here has the computational power of this guy from about six years ago. And there's a reason why this is happening. It's because we're actually making these transistors smaller and making them more power efficient. And so we don't need the gigantic battery inside of here to power this guy because we are using much smaller transistors. But the problem is that these transistors are getting so small that we're actually starting to hit the quantum wall. And of course, we've heard about this before, but let me sort of put some perspective on this. So far, we've been able to make advances in our transistors by doing our best to suppress quantum effects. And now that the uh, 20 nanometer process put up by Intel for the next generation and these guys, they're starting to get 80 atoms across. And at that point, the electron that swims over those atoms is starting to actually really feel the presence of these quantum effects. And so what I'm trying to present today are a set of tools that can actually help us harness those effects rather than suppress them for the future. And actually, you know, this is a problem that has been addressed before in the uh, physics community uh, using a technique called the flux operator as a way of looking at the dynamics inside these systems. And to sort of draw you guys in here, this is sort of the classic scattering problem of quantum mechanics. Uh, understanding how flux occurs over these surfaces is part of the reason we have nuclear weapons today, sadly. But it also may be how we can understand how transistors are going to work tomorrow. Because really the question comes when you get so small, does the electron propagate through the transistor or does it get reflected back? And this is a quantum scattering problem. So the uh, tool that is actually introduced in uh, basically undergraduate quantum mechanics is the uh, classic uh, flux operator right here. And so normally it's presented in this form, less commonly you might encounter in this form, the operator form. And if you guys know something about quantum mechanics, you probably know that one of its basic tenets is that the position and the momentum cannot be perfectly defined at the same time. But if you look at the structure of the flux operator right here, what we've done is we've projected onto a spatial representation, R, and tried to say something about its momentum, P. And so conceptually, this seems at first like it violates Heisenberg uncertainty. Don't worry, I'm not going to suggest it actually does. But it actually raises a very interesting conceptual question. How do we interpret this guy? So you, know, you can look at some of the model problems that people have been looking at and trying to understand what they're trying to get out of the flux. So they produce sort of these pictures like this, where they might get some sort of interesting maps in the middle here, uh, like this sort of uh, distorted flow. And what they do is they integrate over these surfaces, just like we were doing with that sphere, to get a sense of this transmission probability, which will tell us if this guy could be a candidate for our next transistor. And so they create all sorts of pictures like this, which are utterly inscrutable. And so in fact, you can actually go through the literature and find countless papers counting up these vortices and sort of navel gazing about what they possibly could mean. Uh, quantum scattering isn't merely for applications. It can actually be used to understand deep details about uh, fundamental nature. So like for instance, this is a really great uh, image that comes out from 2001. Uh, from a lab over at Harvard. And then what they were doing here is they were shooting out a spray of electrons over a very slightly undulated surface. And so everyone thought at first that this would result in just pure diffusion and nothing very interesting. But because of these quantum effects, actually these uh, very stark branches form. And these are the kinds of conceptual things that we need to know in advance if we're going to design anything around it. Flux comes in because if you go over any one of these branches and put up one of those integration surfaces, you can get the flux at each point. But in these transistors, we're going to end up in a situation called resonance. And so in resonance, is sort of what happens when you have a glass of water and the T-Rex is stomping outside and it creates a little undulation on the uh, surface there. And the reason why we can no longer use the flux when we look at resonance is the following. In a resonance, all of the flow is often accompanied by exact opposite flows. And so actually the flux is always zero here. And we run into the situation that in resonance, this thing that we can study easily on the computer, we cannot use this technique, but yet when we open it up to an environment, that technique is actually the number we're exactly looking for. And we need to find a way to bridge the gap there conceptually if we're going to be able to do anything intelligent for the future. And so my thesis, I hope, has provided an element of the solution to this problem. And so what we do is we go back to the drawing table on the flux operator. So here we are. 
And because we've done this, we've written this flux operator out in direct notation, you can think of these guys right here, these bras and cats, as small delta functions. But we don't actually have to always use a delta function, because the delta function is the uh, asymptotic solution of this Gaussian right here, uh, when the sigma is uh, shrunk down to zero. And when we do that, we can expand the flux operator now in this new Gaussian basis. And so we no longer have these singularities that were perplexing us in the past. And we can come back to the original flux operator by simply shrinking this sigma down to zero. So the first thing you want to know is, when you do a quantum measurement, what you do is you take this operator and you project the state onto its uh, eigenvalues and eigenstates. And so what we do with the uh, expanded flux operator is we solve the eigenvalue equation. The way you do this is a you know, classic uh, problem you might do in undergraduate quantum mechanics. You propose a solution. And what we get is the following solution right here. And what you can see here is this guy, and basically there's two terms, and a plus and the minus in the middle. So to sort of give a conceptual idea of what's happening here is that the guys that we're going to end up measuring on any state uh, that has flux in it, it's going to be a combination of simple uh, probability right there, so this Gaussian right here, and then this is the flux right here. This is the amount of change in the phase in each direction. But if you look at this, you might actually discover something kind of cool about another guy that we also know from quantum mechanics, and this is the coherent wave packet, which bridges classical mechanics to quantum mechanics uh, by finding the closest thing we can get to a particle in a wave equation. And so it's a complex function, and right here I show you the real part of this, of this uh, state. There's an imaginary part, part as well, where you just simply shift, change the shift. And the key ingredient when you look at a coherent wa uh, wave packet is this number right here, k naught sigma. When this number shrinks, the nature of the, fun of the uh, function you see, no matter how you scale it, fundamentally changes. So right now I'm showing a very nice visually appealing uh, number of k naught sigma equals eight. And we bring that down to three. We bring that down to one. And what we're doing is we're actually recreating the components of the Gaussian flux operator eigenstates. So, and that actually comes from a Taylor expansion of the coherent state, which has very similar form to these eigenstates right here. Now, the point that I really want to emphasize is this plus and minus, because what it means is that the expectation value of the flux operator can actually be approximated by looking at two classical particles moving in opposite directions on your wave function. In fact, we're not limited to just two directions, because once I have this model in my computer, I can essentially choose any direction I want. And this is the Husimi function which is essentially a dot product between the current electron wave function and this proposed classical state for it. And what we can do is we can rotate the direction of this electron around and around. And so we can go in the full circle. And when we weight these results by the Husimi function, we get a particular distribution. And what this tells us is that when we're looking at this small transistor and listed in a particular state, and we run through our models, we can actually get a distribution of the classical trajectories inside there that is connected to the flux by the very fact that if you add all these guys up, you get that flux. So what we've done is we've actually taken a single number, the flux, and turned it into an arbitrary number of numbers, I guess an array, uh, of directions. And this basically allows us to really characterize what's happening inside the state. Uh, this isn't merely for navel gazing, actually, because this actually could uh, bridge over to techniques in uh, angular resolved photon, um, photo emission spectroscopy. The idea here is that if you have a sample, what you can do is you can shoot a very focused beam on it, look at the momentum of the electrons that bounce off the surface as a function of, of the angle, and actually recreate these kinds of distributions at various points in your system. And so, for example, one proposal that I'd like to suggest to any experimentalist out here who might have access to an apparatus, uh, I actually am already talking to some folks, but I'd like to bring more into the party. Here's an example. So right here we have graphene with the classic linear intersection at the direct point. These are the kind of classic RPES results you get here. There's a little bit of noise here, but there's a shocking amount of resolution. And it turns out, in additional details, 
imply that the uh, perturbations that come as a result of the flux would actually appear not as Gaussian noise like you see here, but actually super Gaussian noise. And so actually there's a way to actually extract this data from uh, these kinds of pictures. But you know, enough about the theory here, let's go into some examples of how you might want to use this. And I always like to start off with something simple that everyone is familiar with, at least everyone who's done a PhD in physics, or even under, an undergraduate. And so, <laughs> and so here what we've got is a very classic uh, system called the circular billiard. And it can be modeled by a very simple equation where you can decompose into an angular part and a radial part. So the radial part is uh, written right here. Now, if we look at an eigenstate of the system, we get a picture that looks like this. And so um, a, visual, a visual technique I use is the intensity of the color indicates the probability amplitude, and the color indicates the complex argument. Because we're in a closed system, all of those complex arguments are real, and you just see red and blue right here. Now, we've got this pattern here, and we'd like to understand the connection to some sort of classical dynamics. This is a simple system. We know all the classical dynamics that we could possibly have here. But the flux gives us no result because this is a standing state. If we apply the Husimi, however, we get these distributions at various points throughout the system. And if you look closely, some of those distributions seem to be outlining particular paths. And if we choose that particular path as our, as our uh, sampling points, we can create extremely clear pictures. Now, you might be uh, complaining to me right now that I've created, OK, that looks nice. There's some of these uh, vectors sort of seem to be following a, a nice path. But there's always these additional vectors going on right here. What's going on? Well, what's going on is this is a classic uh, symmetry problem in physics. We have rotational symmetry. So if for every one of these classical trajectories, we have infinitely many more that are rotated. And so what happens is that every single point, there are precisely two paths that intersect. We can clean up these pictures by doing a little bit of, a, of a data filtering. So here's an example of a classic uh, momentum state here uh, that has four components. So you can think of this as four electrons sort of intersecting on the, uh, I don't know, transistor superhighway. I don't know, some, some uh, metaphor you could come up with there. When you apply this to see me, right, we know that we have uncertainty in our momentum and position. We never actually get rid of that. What we do is we harness that fact and choose which one we want to see at any particular moment. And so there's always this spread as a result. But we can actually filter through this using, uh, using templates to actually recreate uh, the original distribution uh, in, a, in a pure way and simplify these pictures considerably. So let's move on to another cute example. So we take this circular billiard, and then we apply a vertical magnetic field through it. And one of the other things you might learn from freshman physics, especially if you did a laboratory example where you have to do like, oh, I forgot the name of that thing where you shoot the electrons and then try to see where it goes, but like cathode ray tube, stuff like this, right? So the, the thing that happens is you apply this magnetic field, the Lorentz force causes all the electrons to no longer move in straight lines, but to move in nice little circles. And so you might expect to go from a path on the left that you see here to a path like you see on the right. Uh, one of the ways we can handle this in the Husimi, uh, and actually this is also done in the flux, is by doing the canonical uh, substitution. And you can get a state that looks just like this. You can tell that there's a, certainly a circular component to this, although I have imposed circular boundary conditions. What else did you expect? And we have the flux right here. Now this is really interesting because how do you interpret this flux map I've just given you? One of, the, uh, one of the ideas that you learn uh, from doing these uh, electron stuff with magnetic fields is the cycl cyclotron radius. And it tells us that once we have a charge and once we have a magnetic field, we have a particular radius for it to flow in. So what is the cyclotron radius of this guy right here? Is it this guy going around here? Or is it this guy going around here? You would actually be amazed how many experimentalists and even theorists get a picture like this, think, oh, well, yeah, I understand that and think they're done with it. And they absolutely are not. The reason why is because if you zoom in on any of these points, you realize that the flux is actually an average of all these Husimi projections that I just argued for. And if we use my methods, you actually recreate what the original actual trajectories were, and you create this picture right here. And what is that picture? That picture is the aggregate of these circular paths. And so instead of it being the radius here or the radius there, it's actually the radius right here. 
And so the Houstonian allows us to actually recreate the classical paths that are responsible for the quantum state and help us reinterpret this flux operator and bridge that gap between resonance and transmission. So you can take a state like this. The flux here tells you the aggregate flows. And the Husimi tells you what the actual flows are. And they line up with the classical trajectories. You can do this for other examples. So in this case, we've actually broken some of that symmetry. Uh, here, these were the flux states people were looking at, trying to understand. Again, you'd be shocked how many people were doing vortex counting and hoping they could find some sort of a secret sauce in there. But actually, it's this simple picture that makes perfect sense from classical physics. And you know, I don't want to take up too much time, especially since lunch is around the horizon. And I strongly encourage you to check out more examples at douglasjmason.com. Uh, mainly go to the archive and see the papers we're uh, getting out right now. Uh, we have been looking at problems in graphene, uh, in stadium billiards, uh, and other transmission problems. And I really encourage you to check it out if that's of interest to you. I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators right here, uh, my advisor, Eric Keller, uh, my, uh, not my postdoc, his postdoc. But you sometimes feel like he is yours because you work so hard together. Uh, Mario Baranda over here. And you can check out our group website. And I'd like to thank you all very much.